Good evening, everyone. Welcome to OPRI virtual seminar, Subsea Cable Development and Security Prospects from the Pacific Islands to the Arctic Sea, being live streamed on SPF's YouTube channel. Thank you very much for your joining us again. The subsea cable is expected to expand further. We will discuss today its issues and prospects with the two distinguished speakers, Dr. Amanda Watson, the Department of Pacific Affairs of uh, the Australian National Uni University, and Dr. Daria Spitz from uh, Pompeo Fabra University of Spain. Hide Sakaguchi, president of uh, the OPRI SPF, first uh, extends to you a few words of greeting. Hello, everyone. Buenos dias. Hello, everyone. Buenos dias and good afternoon from Tokyo. My name is Hide Sakaguchi, president of the Ocean Policy Research Institute of Sasakawa Peace Foundation. Welcome to our seminar. Today, we focus on the subsea cable and discuss its issues and prospects from the viewpoint of international relations and international law. Some of you may not be familiar with the background and the purpose of uh, subsea cables and the impact on social and uh, economic development and and the international relations. The subsea cable has a long history. The first one was laid across the Strait of Dover in 1871, connecting the United Kingdom and France, and more followed in other parts of the world supporting communications between major countries. It also served as key infrastructure to support their hegemony. Its value has remained unchanged or even increased over the last 170 years with the growing importance of the internet and the 5G telecommunications. The OPRI has been working to develop a new form of ocean governance, and the subsea cable has important implications on it. We have launched a research project on impacts on ocean governance since this fiscal year. And today's seminar is a second one in this project, and the first one open to the public. Today's speakers are Dr. Amanda Watson of Australian National University, specializing in international relations, and Dr. Daria Schwetz of uh, Pompey Fabra University in Spain, an expert on international law for the polar regions. The discussant is Dr. Fabrizio Bozart, the OPRI's senior research fellow specializing in ocean politics and an ambassador of the sovereign military order of Malta to the Republic of Nauru. We hope discussions on international developments and prospects of the subsea cable of different countries and areas of the world will give us further understanding necessary in our effort to propose a new form of ocean governance. I hope the viewers will also participate in the discussions on how governance of the sea and governance of the ocean should be. Thank you very much and muchas gracias. Gracias. Thank you very much, Mr. Sakaguchi. Now, without further ado, we'd like to move on to presentations. If you have any questions or comments, 
You can send them through a link that appears on the bottom of the screen by 16:30. Also, you can get material, the background information,、uh, by accessing the same link. And from now on, I'd like to hand over the microphone to、uh, Mr. Akamatsu of our institute、uh, to act as a moderator. Good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Tomonari Akamatsu. Of OPRI, I serve as the moderator for the day. Now I'd like to move on to the、uh, first presentation. The first speaker is Dr. Amanda Watson, the research fellow at the Department of Pacific, Pacific Affairs, Coral Reef School of Asia Pacific Affairs of Australian National University. As to her profile, You can also access that information through the link that appears in the bottom of the screen. Now, over to you, Dr.、Uh, Amanda Watson. Arigato. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this event. Thank you, Dr. Sakaguchi, Dr. Komatsu, Dr. Komori, Dr. Bozato. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak. This presentation will explore the issues of geopolitics, cybersecurity, and reliability regarding the undersea internet cables in the Pacific region. Geopolitics, cybersecurity, and reliability, as I will explain, are important issues when it comes to the rollout of these. Cables in the Pacific region. The presentation will introduce the undersea internet cables in the Pacific region, highlight the promises and hoped-for outcomes of infrastructure rollout, outline ongoing research regarding mobile internet pricing in Papua New Guinea as an example of the research that can be undertaken looking at the impacts of the cables, and present results to date. And consider the concepts that I mentioned: geopolitics, cybersecurity, and reliability when it comes to the cables. Undersea internet cables are literally cables on the seabed through which internet traffic can move. So, if you send or receive an email, load a website page, make a Zoom call. Such as this one, or watch a YouTube video, such as this one, or make a WhatsApp call, or things like that. Then it's、uh, there's a good chance that the internet data might be moving through a cable、uh, in at least some part of its its journey. The I'm referring to them as undersea cables. They're also, of course, called subsea or submarine cables. The cables can be international between countries, as Dr. Sakaguchi mentioned, or they can be domestic between coastal places or islands within countries. The undersea internet cables are laid by ships, and I'm focusing on the internet. But of course, telephone call infrastructure can also be through cables such as these. Cables are one part of a system that has four parts. The wet side is the portion of the cable that is under the sea. The beach manhole is where the cable emerges from the sea to the land. The submarine cable landing station houses all the necessary equipment, including power supply, to take the signal from the cable and pass it on to a terrestrial system. And the backhaul includes the circuits. That connect the submarine cable landing station to another terminating point. For example, a telecommunication company's exchange, and from this terminating point, that is, from the end of the backhaul, the voice or data can be distributed to smaller capacity circuits over a network. In some countries, telecommunication companies are able to build backhaul facilities to the submarine cable landing station. For example, in Singapore,、uh, this is possible, and that enables competition. 
Alternative technologies to undersea internet cables include satellites. Uh, it's one of the main ones is satellite. Uh, and this picture here is of O3B, which is a series of satellites along the equator. And that provides internet to any area or most areas anyway, within 50 degrees north of the equator and 50 degrees south of the equator. For instance, Digicel in Papua New Guinea has been using O3B for a number of years to provide internet to its customers in Papua New Guinea. Another example is Pacific, which is one of Asia Pacific, Pacific's newest satellites. And Pacific is currently setting up small dishes all over Papua New Guinea and other Pacific nations, including Vanuatu. And so you've got a few options in terms of uh, internet being distributed. Internet cables underneath the sea is one option. Satellites are another option. Uh, there's microwave and, of course, underground cables uh, as needed. But this talk will focus on the undersea cables. I want to just uh, tell you why I think they're of interest. I think there's three key reasons. One is because of the significant amount of laying of cables that has occurred in the Pacific in recent years and planned expansion of the cables into the Pacific in coming years. In a recent article in The Diplomat, it was pointed out that just four Pacific Island nations and territories were connected to an undersea cable, an international undersea cable in 2007, but nearly all of the Pacific Island nations and territories will be connected to a cable within the next several years. Another reason why I think this is important is because many of these cables are funded as aid projects. And so this raises questions of how the funding allocation decisions are made uh, and potentially has geopolitical or cyber security implications. I also think it's important because of the promises made relating to the cables, particularly at the time of the launch. Uh, but before getting into those, let me introduce the cables in the Pacific to you. And this is a map that was produced by the map making service at Australian National University called CARTO GIS with information that I provided to them. The map includes cable connections with Pacific nations. Other cables in the Pacific Ocean are not shown on the map. For instance, cables from Australia to Singapore or Australia to the United States or Australia to New Zealand or other places. I've only included cables on this map if they're landing at one or more Pacific Island nations or territories or collectivities. Note that domestic cables are not shown on this map. So for instance, uh, the domestic cable within Papua New Guinea, domestic cable within French Polynesia, and so on. So this is the international undersea internet cables for Pacific countries on this map. Note that dotted lines on the map are cables that are not yet laid, whereas solid lines are cables that are in existence already. I'd also note that both Guam and Hawaii have multiple cable connections to the United States and elsewhere. So any Pacific Island nation that has a cable to Guam or Hawaii can be thought to have reasonably good internet access. This is similar for cables going to Australia. As I said, I haven't shown cables going from Australia to California or elsewhere in my map just to try and keep it clear. I want to point out that there are Pacific Island nations that do not have undersea cable connections at present, although there are more being planned. At present, the places without undersea internet cables are Tokelau, Nauru, Kiribati, Pitcairn Islands, Tuvalu, and Norfolk Island. Tokelau, Nauru and Kiribati, there's been discussions about cables and there were cables planned for this year for them. Uh, Tuvalu has no cable, as I said, but there is a World Bank project to include a cable for Tuvalu, although no details are available to date. And of course, it's worth also noting that the outer islands of some countries do not have uh, cables, even if they're main hubs do have cables. 
So turning now to the promises and hopes associated with the cables, I've introduced the cables to you briefly. So what are the anticipated benefits of the cables? What are people told to expect? I'm going to share with you some of the uh, promises made about cables in Papua New Guinea and New Way, just as examples. Uh, and many other cables also have much promise associated with them. So just to introduce a first example, the Coral Sea Cable System, which was funded by Australia and officially launched in December 2019. It is a cable from Sydney to the capital of Papua New Guinea, Port Moresby, and also to the capital of Solomon Islands, Honiara. And the funding for the Coral Sea Cable System also includes funding for the Solomon Islands Domestic Network, which is a cable within Solomon Islands. There was an earlier cable from Port Moresby to Sydney, which was laid in 2006 and recently decommissioned after the Coral Sea Cable System was officially launched. In terms of Solomon Islands, Solomon Islands only had satellite internet access before this cable was laid and the Coral Sea Cable System is expected to increase internet capacity in Solomon Islands by 6,000 times relative to the estimated satellite usage in 2019. The Coral Sea Cable System is for two countries, but with regard to Papua New Guinea, Papua New Guinea's then Communication Minister Sam Basil said in April 2018 when the cable was being announced that it would be 200 times faster than the existing cables and would reduce the cost of the internet, presumably meaning the cost of the internet to everyday internet users. That would be a reasonable interpretation of what he said. Papua New Guinea also has a new domestic cable. This is the Kumul cable, as it's known, which is the red line on the map on the screen. It connects coastal towns and islands in Papua New Guinea with Port Moresby, the capital city, so that the internet can then travel on to Sydney from there, or to Medang, where there's also a cable going to Guam that was laid in 20, uh, sorry, 2009, the cable was laid connecting Medang to Guam. So the Kumul cable has just been laid. It was funded through a loan from China's Exim Bank and laid by Huawei Marine. The Kumul cable is expected to include a connection to Indonesia. That's a blue line that you can see on the screen going from Venamo, the northwesternmost town in Papua New Guinea, to Jayapura just across the border. However, that Jayapura connection has been delayed. The uh, head of the relevant body in Papua New Guinea told me recently that it has still not yet been laid. The alleged reason is because of COVID-19. So regarding the Kumul cable in Papua New Guinea, this domestic cable within Papua New Guinea connecting coastal towns and islands, the Papua New Guinea Data Co CEO, and this is the body that is connecting uh, this cable and then managing this cable. Uh, he was quoted in May 2020 as saying that the Kumul cable would allow much cheaper, faster and more efficient internet. Talking about the same cable, another official was quoted in March 2020 as saying that the cable would reduce internet prices and there have been many more such pro proclamations from various sources in Papua New Guinea. And this is just a bit of a flavour of some of the kind of promises and hopes that have been made and repeated in the media about the Kumul cable and the Coral Sea cable in Papua New Guinea. Another example is the New Zealand funded Manatua cable. The Manatua One Polynesia cable connects Apia in Samoa, Niue, two places in Cook Islands, that's Rarotonga and Aitutaki, two landing stations in French Polynesia at Tahiti and Bora Bora. And the major funder for this cable is the New Zealand government, although there's also funding from the Asian Development Bank and the recipient governments. This cable goes to some countries that never had cables before, such as Niue, uh, and also goes to countries that already had some cables, such as French Polynesia, 
which already had an undersea cable, and also Samoa, which already had a cable. So in Niue, remembering this is Niue's first internet cable, the cable was launched and became live in May this year. And these photos are happy photos that were taken at the cable launch event in May this year. There were similar promises made in terms of the speed of the internet and the affordability of the internet compared to what we saw in the Papua New Guinea examples. Uh, those promises were made in a new way government press release and also by the head of Telecom New Way, a telecommunication company in New Way. I'd just like to remind you that cables increase bandwidth. It's a bit like if you have a water pipe through which water can travel. Uh, but perhaps only a limited amount of water can travel through that pipe because of the size of the pipe. So if you increase the size of the pipe, then more water can get through. So similarly with cables, they increase the bandwidth of the available internet, but much hope is placed on them in terms of the internet speed, price, uptake and reliability. Turning now to my ongoing research on undersea internet cables in the Pacific. As we've said, these cables increase capacity, but assumptions and promises are often made about the potential positive impacts of the cables on uptake, that is the number of people using the, cable, using the internet, speeds, pricing and reliability. So the overall aim of my research is to assess whether these promises are met. And I'll give you an example regarding my research with colleagues on internet prices in Papua New Guinea. So this research on mobile internet prices in Papua New Guinea is done with two academics in Papua New Guinea, Pikieri and Moses Sakai. They, take, they undertake weekly checks of the internet speeds using their mobile phones and have done so since January 2020 because the Coral Sea Cable was launched in December 2019. So we wanted, wanted to monitor to see if there was any effect on internet prices. And they do this using the menus in their phones, such as the one appearing on the screen. The image on the screen says press one for data plans, press three for call plans, and so on. These menus, we use them because they would keep up to date and would capture any temporary offers we figured this is a good way to do it. And we check the prices every Monday on the three networks that are available in Papua New Guinea. So if there is any change, we will catch it within one week of it occurring. Our findings to date are that there's been no perceptible decrease in the mobile internet prices in Papua New Guinea since the Coral Sea Cable System was launched in December, 2019. So despite promises of decreases in internet prices, there's been no change to date. It's worth noting that throughout 2020, for the whole calendar year 2020, there were negotiations going on over pricing between the wholesaler data co and also the regulator. So there were some uh, difficulties and public consultations uh, and so on over that time regarding wholesale internet regulation. It's worth noting in that country that wholesale internet prices are regulated. Those are the prices that are charged by the wholesaler to the internet service providers and the mobile telecommunication companies. Um, but the prices charged by those companies to the retail customers, the everyday people and small business owners, those prices are not regulated in Papua New Guinea. Turning now to the final section of my talk, which is on geopolitics, cybersecurity, and reliability, and why any of this matters. Why are the cables worth studying and what they show as a case study? I'm going to talk about each of these three issues in turn, one after the other, although, of course, they are interrelated. It's been suggested that undersea internet cables have emerged as a sensitive area of diplomacy in the Pacific, given their central role in international communications. So this is 
suggesting there is a link between geopolitics and diplomacy and cables. Huawei has been subjected to repeated rounds of sanctions by the United States of America and allegations that its products could be used by Beijing for spying, a charge consistently denied by the Chinese company. In short, China is accused of planning to exploit undersea cable networks to spy on other countries. Taiwan has also expressed concerns. David Brennan and John Feng wrote in December last year that Taiwan has claimed that China is backing private investment in Pacific undersea cable networks as a way to spy on foreign nations and steal data. And they quote from a named foreign ministry spokesperson. As an example, I'll turn again to the Coral Sea Cable System, which, as I said, was funded by Australia. Uh, this is to give you an example of how geopolitics can influence aid funding decisions. And a reminder that it was funded by Australia for two countries, Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands. The government of Solomon Islands had reportedly organized for a Chinese company to lay a cable from Solomon Islands to Australia. But the Australian government stepped in to fund the project instead. According to the PI Institute of Geoeconomic Studies in Tokyo, he wrote in February this year that Australia's investment in the Coral Sea Cable System shut out Huawei Marine, which had originally been contracted by the Solomon Islands government to lead the project. So if this is correct, it means that the Solomon Islands government tore up a contract that they had already signed with Huawei. But Papua New Guinea did use Huawei Marine for a domestic cable within Papua New Guinea, as I said, using a Chinese loan. Now, I have heard that Australia offered to, do a, to provide a domestic cable within Papua New Guinea too, although I haven't seen that in writing. If that is the case, Papua New Guinea evidently declined that offer and went with the Huawei Marine uh, arrangement. Of course, all of this relates to cybersecurity because of the allegations of uh, spying and cybersecurity risks that have been uh, made against Huawei by the United States, Australia and others. As you might know, Huawei has been blocked from participation in Australia's national broadband network and also Australia's 5G networks, uh, and the US has sanctions against them, as I mentioned, and so on. Another example of how geopolitics influences cable access is to look at the East Micronesia cable. This is a light blue line on my screen and on my map, on your screen, and it's a dotted line because it's an incomplete cable. The East Micronesia cable system was to connect Pompeii in the Federated States of Micronesia with Kosrai, also in the Federated States of Micronesia, and Nauru and Kiribati, and was expected to be completed by the middle of this year. The East Micronesia cable was to be funded by the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. A recent tender process for the East Micronesia cable, which, as I said, was to be funded by the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, elicited warnings from the United States of America to the Federated States of Micronesia, Nauru and Kiribati, those recipient countries, about security threats posed by a Chinese company's cut price bid. That's according to Jonathan Barrett, a journalist with Reuters. Such concerns may have been behind a decision to declare all three bids as invalid. Of course, I don't know, there may have been other reasons why the three bids that were received for this cable did not meet the requirements. Uh, however, it's, uh, that's unclear. So Nauru is one of the countries that was to be connected to the East Micronesia cable. And I believe that we do have some officials from Nauru on this call today. As I understand it, and I'd be interested to hear from those officials, but as I understand it, there now are two options for Nauru, two that have been reported publicly anyway. Nauru has reportedly been considering a cable route that would connect to Solomon Islands, which is south of Nauru. So the cable could go potentially from Nauru 
down to Honiara in Solomon Islands, and then the internet traffic could go on to Sydney through the Coral Sea cable system. This would allow internet traffic, as I said, to flow from Nauru through Solomon Islands to Australia and elsewhere, the United States and so on. So that's one possibility that has been reported. Another possibility is that the United States of America may step in to fund a cable following the same route as that initially planned for the East Micronesia cable. I hope that these two examples that I've given you, the Solomon Islands situation and also the, um, the one that I've just talked about, the East Micronesia cable, I hope that these two examples have shown you how geopolitics can be entwined with aid funding allocation decisions and ultimately cable access for average people. Turning to cybersecurity now, which is related to geopolitics, of course, and writing on findings from discussions with 107 Pacific security practitioners around the Pacific, Jay Caldwell wrote that cybersecurity was regularly raised in consultations, but the capacity needs in this area were unclear. So Pacific government officials and those kinds of people are aware of cybersecurity as a concern, but unsure what sort of training or capacity building they might need in that area. Jay Caldwell goes on to say that the recent or forthcoming connection of undersea cables to Pacific states uh, is a driver of risk perception, cyber risk perception amongst Pacific officials and security practitioners. Rudolf Kreis and Sharma have also argued that the new cables have increased the risks for Pacific Island nations in terms of becoming victims of cyber attacks and cyber crime. Certainly, it's clear that if there's greater internet capacity, there could potentially be more uses of the internet. And if people are using the internet for a wider range of things, potentially internet banking that was previously done in the bank branches, things like that, then as internet in, uh, uptake increases, it is possible that there could be an increase in terms of cyber attacks and cyber risk that any internet user might experience anywhere in the world. That's a general risk. And then there is, of course, uh, a separate risk that we've alluded to regarding whether certain companies uh, might have certain risks associated with their equipment. Rudolf, Kreese and Sharma have also argued that capacity is an issue, saying that in the Pacific, in the Pacific Island nations, one main issue is the lack of qualified people. The final point I want to make is about the reliability of the cables. Clearly, there are various potential risks to the reliability of the cables and the potential benefits that might come from the cables. Natural disasters could damage cables. And of course, climate change is going to increase the severity and frequency of natural disasters. So it could be that cables might be damaged. And for instance, potentially a whole country might be without the internet. Earthquakes would be another risk. And of course, we know that earthquakes are common in parts of the Pacific and could potentially damage cables. There are regulatory issues, and it can be that regulation can potentially enhance the access to and use of the internet, potentially uh, improve competition, affordability, and so on. But regulatory issues might also have negative impacts or delay potential benefits. There are financial issues. For instance, the head of the wholesaler in Papua New Guinea, Paul Convoy, referred to the debt that the wholesaler has and said that he and his regular, sorry, his wholesaler, his organization is having trouble funding or, or paying their suppliers. He mentioned that in a, in a webinar in May this year. So financial issues might impact upon the maintenance and upkeep of cables. I'd also mention anti-competitive monopolies. So as I alluded to, some submarine cable landing stations have quite open and accessible policies. For instance, landing stations in Singapore, and it's seen that this can increase competition between telecommunication companies if they can access the landing stations. 
However, in some Pacific Island nations, there's only one entity that's able to access the cable or the cable landing station, which of course may mean that uh, some benefits don't flow on to consumers. That's all that I'd like to say for now. Thank you again for inviting me to speak in this webinar. アマンダさんどうもありがとうございました。なお、種別兼任教授のご経歴につきましても画面下のリンクからアクセス可能ですぜひご覧ください。ではダリアさんよろしくお願いいたします Thank you So good afternoon. Uh, once again, and before starting, I would like to express my gratitude to organizers of the seminar for inviting me and uh, providing this opportunity to speak today and share my knowledge and explain the research I do on submarine cables in the Arctic. Um, my name is Daria Schwitz, as uh, has been mentioned already. And uh, although I, I currently work as an adjunct professor at the Univers Universitat Pompeo Fabra, but originally I come from Russia, Siberia, one of the coldest areas on earth that actually correlates with my interest in the Arctic affairs. My presentation today will be structured based on this roadmap that you can see on the slide. And since I come from a legal background, my report is more dedicated to the legal regime of submarine cables and the particularities of the Arctic. But I will also address security issues <clears throat> I'm going to start with a short introduction into the legal regime. Uh, sorry, a uh, short int introduction about submarine cables. Then I will dive deep into the legal regime under international law, also explaining the particularities of our regulation in the Arctic region. Afterwards, I will switch to practical examples on cable development in the Arctic, and in particular, we'll give an overview on already completed projects, projects that um, are that are under uh, investigation are under uh, development and the very first uh, transarctic submarine cable project, the Polar Express cable project. In the end, I will address uh, the question of security in the Arctic in the context of submarine cables and finally provide several conclusions. At the first point of introduction, I would like to make clear the terminology I'm going to use. As Amanda already mentioned, uh, often we can uh, we can find various ways to address submarine cables. They might be called undersea cables, marine, submerged, etc. But in my presentation, I'm going to use the expression submarine. Why? Since it's the only wording used in international law, in particular in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea as the main regulatory document that refers to submarine cables. Amanda has already made a perfect introduction and uh, highlighted the importance of submarine cables. So perhaps there is no need to repeat uh, the importance of submarine cables for modern communications. But perhaps just to give a uh, few numbers. Uh, it is estimated now, now that from 95 to 98 percent of all international telecommunications are currently run by modern fiber optic cables. There are more than 400 cables that you can now see on the slide. As, and as you can probably um, see that the majority of cables are concentrated on the southern part of our uh, planet, while on the north, there is not much, uh, not many cables laid so far. That's why, uh, well, the cables play an extraordinary role and there is probably no need to repeat it one more time. But in contrast to densely populated areas, in the Arctic cables is a pioneer industry. Why? Because due to severe climate conditions, such as extreme temperatures, ice-covered areas, and non-accessibility of cable ships to this region, 
and uh, inexperience of laying cables for small rural communities. For a long time, laying a cable in the Arctic was not considered as feasible. So only from a relatively recent time, the first cable projects appeared, with now the first Trans-Arctic Cable, Polar Express, under construction, and I'm going to um, explain it a bit more in detail further. Now let me proceed with the legal regime of submarine cables under international law. As I have mentioned, the main international agreement dedicated to all issues of the sea is the so-called Constitution of the Oceans, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, 1982. And I'm going to mention it as the UNCLOS, therefore. This convention contains nine articles mentioning submarine cables. I'm not going to explain uh, all the maritime areas and all the regulations provided by the convention, but I will just explain the general logic of the convention and how it treats submarine cables in different maritime areas. So the whole logic of the convention is the division of the waters of the ocean to various maritime areas where states have different rights and obligations. In waters closer to land, um, states have more rights and freedoms, while more you go to the open sea, more it becomes uh, available for the international community. I shall uh, highlight that according to convention, both landlocked as well as coastal state, states have the right to lay submarine cables in the high seas, the area reserved for international community, for fiscal purposes and open for all states on our planet. The UNCLOS does not make any specific mention and any specific reference to the Arctic waters. There is only one article that mentions ice-covered areas, ice-covered waters, and the obligation of states on the environmental protection. However, this regulation is rather general, as well as other above-mentioned um, uh, above mentioned, uh, regulations of the Convention. Therefore, the majority of rules are established in domestic law of Arctic states, where they are entitled to exercise different rights depending on the maritime zone established by international law. It should be also mentioned that apart from the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and domestic laws, certain other international agreements also partially regulate submarine cables. For instance, international regulations for preventing collisions at sea 1972 consider cable ship as a vehicle restricted in maneuver and therefore all other ships are obliged to exercise certain precautions in relation to it or another example would be the convention on the protection of underwater cultural heritage 2001 that contains only one but very interesting clause in particular that submarine cables are not considered as underwater cultural heritage and thus are exempt from its protection as an additional level international of international law regulation, on a fragmentary basis, resolutions of international organizations such as International Maritime Organization or recommendations of International Telecommunications Union are also issued. However, and let me express this idea once again, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is the main uh, agreement governing submarine cables on international level, whose provisions are further implemented in national law of Arctic states. Switching now from international to regional level of the Arctic governments, I would like to highlight that in contrast to the Antarctic Treaty system, regulating the legal regime of the Antarctic, the North Pole does not have anything similar. The Antarctic Treaty, signed in 1959, promotes peaceful use, freedom of scientific investigation and cooperation among states and constitutes a core of the legal regulation of the South Pole. Unlike it, in the Arctic, there is no treaty centrally governing this region. Instead, several separate treaties are in place. For instance, the Svalbard City regulating the status of Svalbard, the Arctic Cooperation Agreement between the United States and Canada on the question of navigation in Northwest Passage. And starting from the establishment of the Arctic Council in 1991, several more binding agreements in relation to documents um, uh, and recommendation character documents were issued. 
However, none of these agreements concern submarine cables. Therefore, there is no specific uh, regulation of submarine cables in the Arctic as of the date. Nevertheless, the interest of various stakeholders in regulation of the Arctic cables is growing every year. Apart from legally binding agreements, the so-called soft law instruments without binding legal force are in place in relation to submarine cables in the Arctic. In particular, in 2008, representatives of five coastal states bordering the Arctic Ocean, Canada, Denmark, Norway, United States, and the Russian Federation, have confirmed in a Lulisan declaration that below the sea, meaning the UNCLOS, provides for important rights and obligations for other uses of the seabed. Among others, it refers to laying of submarine cables. Government officials from Arctic states also expressed that electronic communication services, including submarine cables, is one of the priorities for the Arctic development agenda to improve the connectivity in the Arctic. Apart from that, Task Force on Improved Connectivity in the Arctic was established in 2017 and in the framework of the Arctic Council. And in, 19, in 2019, they issued the report on improved connectivity in the Arctic. And finally, quite recently, in May 2021, foreign ministers of the Arctic states at the 12th ministerial meeting of the Arctic Council adopted the Reykjavik Declaration, where they highlighted among the priorities the development of free island infrastructure and connectivity in the Arctic. And finally, since the Russian Federation has recently taken the chairmanship in the Arctic Council for several upcoming years, in its strategy until 2023, titled Responsible Governments for a Sustainable Arctic, it has announced the development of telecommunication system for the well-being and prosperity in the Arctic. After addressing the legal basis of cables, let me now turn to the practical aspect of my presentation and give you visibility of cable um, on cable projects in the Arctic. I will start with successfully completed short lines of Arctic cables, continue with several initiatives to lay the long transarctic line, and then we'll address the first transarctic cable already under construction, the Polar Express cable. So one of the first lines to be uh, that was completed in the Arctic was Svalbard undersea, undersea sorry, cable system that was laid in 2004 with the purpose to connect Svalbard with Norway mainland. Important remark as, is that a uh, lane of cable in the Arctic requires presence of a special cable ship suitable to navigate and lay cable in the cold Arctic water. So um, basically, it's not the same to lay a submarine cable in the Asia-Pacific region than to lay a cable in the Arctic, where sometimes even the services of icebreaker are required. Another project performed in 2009 was Greenland Connect cable system connecting Canada, Greenland and Iceland. From the legal point of view, the legal regulation of the cable was according to the UNCLOS maritime zones and in particular territorial seas of both three states and their domestic rules accordingly. In 2017, Greenland Connect North had cable followed. The line located on the west coast of Greenland connecting small towns there. In this case, legally, it is subject to Danish legislation and can be considered as domestic submarine cable since it is laid close to the coast and thus does not enter to the area of the high seas that does not belong to any state under international law. Apart from relatively short completed lines of cables, the Arctic, uh, in the Arctic, uh, several initiatives to lay trans-Arctic cables, long lines, are being developed. The first one was Russian uh, optical transarctic cable system to connect Tokyo and London that emerged in early 2000. The planned length was 16,000 kilometers, but this project has not entered into construction force. Another project was PolarNet cable project. In the framework of this project, an extensive marine survey operations were conducted and from that time, it became clear that such a long cable can be laid in the Arctic, even in, um, in the severe conditions of the North. The project was under discussion for more than 10 years. 
however, received no further development. Arctic Connect project cable system. It was initiated by Finnish company Sinia and Russian telecom company Megaphone to connect Norway with Tokyo. Even though the development phase of the project has progressed as planned and the funding for this phase um, has been secured, it was decided by stakeholders to put the development of this cable on hold. This decision was announced recently in May 2021. Quintillion submarine cable system was initially planned to connect Tokyo with London and perform as a long line going through the Arctic. However, it was not fully implemented as initially planned and only received implementation of the first stage that resulted in a cable line connecting small towns on the west coast of Alaska. And now I'm going to turn to the first transarctic cable that is currently under construction. Among all the cables that I have mentioned before, this is the only cable that actually entered into a real construction phase. This is the unique project of a transarctic submarine fiber uh, optic communication line with a total length of 12,650 kilometers. The project will connect Murmansk, the Russian uh, city of Murmansk, to Vladivostok along the shortest route from Europe to Asia. The interesting feature of this cable, in contrast to previous cables that um, I have mentioned, is that it appears to be fully state-driven, owned, installed, and further maintained by the Russian Federation. Ministry of Transport of Russia, together with Federal Agency for Maritime and River Transport, are the customers of this project. Federal State Unitary Enterprise Rosemore Port acts as the contractor developer and operator Marsat is also a federal state unitary enterprise. Finally, only the main contracting organization, Perspective Technologies Agency Joint Stock Company, is a non-state owned um, enterprise, but it only but it is only contracted to install the cable while the ownership and maintenance will be fully state owned. The cable is already under construction and this summer first four kilometers. Um, relate from the Russian small village in Deriberka, and uh, the cable is planned to be finished in 2026. Also, this cable is being laid in the framework of the Russian Arctic strategy until 2035. Among the activities listed in the strategy, one of the priorities is the Trans-Arctic cable. So the Polar Express aims to provide the geographically shorter uh, route for telecommunications traffic between Europe and Asia, and thereby minimize the delay in the transmission of information to develop the port infrastructure of the high north and expand the international infrastructure um, of backbone fiber optic communication lines. After understanding uh, the whole basis of the legal regime of submarine cables under international law, as well as cable project developments in the Arctic, the last point of this presentation will be uh, security concerns that may rise in connection to the activity of submarine cables laying in the Arctic. I have identified several con security concerns, but it is, um, of course, non-exhaustive list and several other points perhaps may be added. The first one is scientific concern. After the construction of the Polar Express cable that is planned, and let me repeat myself, uh, for 2026, the Russian federations will um, exercise the total control over the cable itself and its infrastructure under domestic law. Since Polar Express cable is planned to be laid very close to the Russian coast, it would fully fall into the Russian jurisdiction according to international law. Not only the cable itself, but also all the infrastructure, including, for instance, landing stations. It might raise concerns from the scientific point of view. Cables are known for their contribution to scientific research when various sensors measuring temperature, salinity, and other characteristics are measured. Being fully under Russian control, there might be a risk of non-cooperation from the Russian government in sharing scientific results since the exclusivity of results might have an extraordinary value. The Arctic region is still considered one of the less explored regions from the scientific point of view, and unique knowledge about this region may want to be kept in a secret. Even in the case of willingness to such scientific cooperation, 
the exclusive jurisdiction and state ownership of the cable might result in delays and bureaucratic procedures to obtain permissions and licenses for foreign uh, sensors installation initiated for by foreign scientists. The next concern would be a geopolitical concern. No doubt that Polar Express cable will strengthen the connectivity infrastructure not only um, in the north, but also the whole Russian telecommunication system. However, there, on the other side of the coin, it may contribute to the Russians' isolation in cyberspace. During last years, the idea of creating so-called RUMET, the closed internet space for Russian citizens, to be separated from the world web has been actively promoted by Russian government. There were several steps and announcements by government officials towards it. The very aim of it, um, of it is to ensure the Russian independence from the outside world should threaten in a cybersecurity appeal. The Russian telecommunications agency Roskomnadzor already has uh, legislative powers to block or decrease the speed of certain websites, for example, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or other social networks that may appear as the threat to the Russian cybersecurity. Installation of the Polar Express cable may contribute to the closeness of the RUNET, and there will be more capacity to run internet independently without any foreign dependence using Russian analogs. Even Deputy Chairman of the Security Council of the Russian Federation, Dmitry Medvedev, announced that likelihood of disconnecting Russia from the global network exists and the country is ready for it. Another concern to follow is cybersecurity concern. For now, until the cable project is not completed and uh, non-operative, it's hard to predict how exactly it will operate. However, in the future, there is a possibility that it will be connected to other lines to actually connect Europe and Asia. This is the very idea of laying a transarctic cable to reduce the distance and uh, increase speed of connections by rerouting flows, by rerouting data flows. And it was confirmed by General Director of Morsvev Sputnik that it is possible to attract foreign partners to project and to create lines that will connect Murmansk region with Europe and the Primorsky territory with Asia. Nevertheless, the attraction of foreign partners won't change the governance of the Polar Express cable in the Russian waters. And there is a possibility of controlling and copying data coming through the cable since no external control may be exercised. Although practices of spying and listening uh, through special devices are practices dated back to the previous century and war times, it is not possible to fully exclude this concern even in our time. The data position is a great leverage that might be employed by state to promote its interests in international arena. Then comes human security concern uh, of the Arctic communities in cyberspace and in connection to submarine cable installation. The first transarctic cable will definitely bring changes to the lives of remote Russian communities living in the north. Those services that uh, are now considered as luxury will be available at, hopefully, at a low cost and on a permanent basis. For instance, uh, telemedicine, uh, online education, ordering goods and uh, services through internet, or the possibility of conducting high quality video conferences. On the other hand, it may result in losing indigenous way of living, local traditions, practices and customs. Being more accustomed to the use of telecommunications and thus be more dependent on them, uh, they will at the same time become more, become more vulnerable to its failures and disruptions. Environmental security might also be included in the list of security concerns in the Arctic. Even though the impact from cables uh, in the Arctic cannot be compared with other more harmful activities, such as, for instance, oil and gas exploitation, in the course of cable installation, adjacent areas are nevertheless affected. Noise, vibration, damage of the seabed during the cable burial affects local flora and fauna. The same applies to cable maintenance operations. Cable faults and damages cannot be avoided. It is visible from the experience um, of cables in other parts of the world. And here in the Arctic, the risk of cable damage is even bigger due, due to cold waters and moving ice. Should the, uh, should the cable fault happen, 
a cable ship shall arrive to the place of damage to fix the problem. It is not always possible for cable ships, since certain areas may be covered by ice, and for this services of icebreaker are required. That increases the presence of ships in the RP, time for repair or prevention, and possible impact on living organisms. And finally, according to the Russian Arctic uh, Development Strategy until 2035, there is an increase of conflict potential in the Arctic. And I have titled it as a military security. Should the military conflict rise in the region and the possibility of military conflict still exist, since non-regulated disputes still exist between Arctic states, the Polar Express cable would be among the targets. The history knows of uh, knows cases of cutting cables of enemies during the war to limit its communications capability. So I can cannot um, wholly exclude uh, this type of security as well. Now let me turn to conclusions. The first one is that international law does not foresee specific legal regime for suffering cables in the Arctic. General clauses of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea apply, and the rest is predominantly regulated by domestic law of the Arctic states. Therefore, northern submarine cables may significantly arise from one state, from one state to another. Submarine cables are getting more and more attention as the infrastructure of future for the Arctic. In the implementation of infrastructure improvements, submarine cables play a significant role. The Polar Express cable would likely be the only would not likely be the only one, and more cables will be laid in the future. Not only Arctic states, but non-Arctic states are also interested in connecting to the Trans-Arctic cable and the prolongation of lines to extend it to other regions of the world. Then the Polar Express cable may complicate relations in the region between the Russian Federation and other Arctic states, as well as non-Arctic states. There are several security matters that I have addressed before that might appear in relation to cable laying activity in the Arctic. Among them are scientific, geopolitical, cybersecurity, human security, environmental, and military concern. This is without prejudice to any other concern that may appear in this region. And as a final point, I believe that there is still time for the Arctic Council as the governance body in the Arctic region uh, to step in to make a connection and to address submarine cables and come to a common conclusion on their status, regulation, and future in the Arctic. This is all for today. Uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. Nadia, yeah, thank you very much. Daria, thank you very much. Uh, discussing uh, the illegal regime of uh, the submarine cable and uh, light and shadow, so to speak, of uh, the uh, submarine uh, cable project that is now underway in the uh, Russian Arctic region. Now I'd like to invite uh, the uh, Dr. Uh, Fabrizio uh, Bozalt uh, as uh, the uh, discussant. Uh, he's uh, the uh, OPRI so the, a senior research, uh, senior research fellow, and I'm going to uh, continue uh, moderate. And uh, please uh, send us uh, the, uh, your questions and comments uh, through the URL uh, to, uh, on the bottom of the screen. I'd like to invite uh, our panelists uh, the, to respond as much as possible. Now, uh, Botsa, would you please, uh, Fabrizio, would you please uh, give us uh, your comment, please? Thank you, Dr. Akamatsu. President Sakaguchi, Your Excellencies, distinguished speakers, dear colleagues and dear fellow scholars, dear friends of the ocean, here in Japan and abroad, greetings. Today, I have the distinct honor and pleasure of offering some comments and remarks on two informative and insightful presentations given by two outstanding scholars who joined us from two continents, Australia and Europe, and thematically from the Pacific Islands and the Arctic region. I would like to start my comments by stating 
a simple but pivotal truth, that we live in a world of light. In the case of the undersea cable network, that light is made of pulses, optic pulses, flashes of light traveling along what we can describe as the most important infrastructures for the planet, for today and even more so for tomorrow. That infrastructure is analogous, similar, is reminiscent of a nervous system. It is the global nervous system transmitting information and co uh, enabling coordination and movement among different parts of the planet. Our economy, transportation, security and defense, education, entertainment, and also our social life often depend on the efficiency on the, of the undersea cable network. Civilization as we know it today depends on it. Yet, until recently, we've been taking it for granted or thought that it was the satellites. We should remember, we should keep in mind that the undersea cable network is a marine infrastructure. And that is a strong reminder of the importance of the oceans for humanity. The presentations of today's distinguished speakers were about two key quadrants of the global ocean, the Pacific Islands region and the Arctic region. Regions that until recently were considered peripheral, but are now increasingly coming to the fore of global geopolitics, economy, climate change discourse, and geostrategy. For climate change discourse, just think about the melting ice of the Arctic, the rising sea level. As for geostrategy, it's, I believe it's enough to mention the recently formed trilateral security partnership among Australia, the UK, United Kingdom, and the United States. Here at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation and at the Ocean Policy Research Institute, I am with. My colleagues and I are very aware of the importance of the two regions, and we pay special attention to them. And because the Sasakawa Peace Foundation is a do, a think, do, and innovate tank, we proactively engage with them and try to make a little but non-negligible difference. So I can assure you that we did not go for an exotic choice by inviting Dr. Watson and Dr. Schwetz to speak about those two regions at this seminar. On the contrary, our intent was to explore the future and the possibilities in those important regions using the undersea cable network discourse as a vector. Dr. Watson's presentation expounded very clearly that the undersea cable development in the Pacific Islands stands at the intersection of geopolitics, aid diplomacy, regional development, human development, and very opportunely, the focus was also on the people of the Pacific, and very rightly so, because they should be considered the most important subject in undersea cable development and connectivity, because they are the ones they are supposed to benefit from this service and for increased connectivity. 
even better, faster internet connectivity helps compressing time and transcending space. And it doesn't only enable Pacific Islanders to access information, but also to have their voice heard when it comes to the challenges that the region is facing, climate change in premise. In this sense, I dare say that for the general public in the Pacific Islands, it is not a main concern whether cable connectivity is delivered by China or Western partners. Their main concerns are about access, speed, and affordability. As for the political elites of the island countries, they have to act as skilled big power rivalry managers in order to avoid being big power rivalry impacted. It is undeniable that big power rivalry is played out also around undersea cable development in the Pacific. From the point of view of Western countries, Western powers, it is imperative to continue the strategic denial toward China by using a negative regime representation, engaging in economic competition and technology competition, and playing the positioning game. Speculatively, also China further a discourse of negative representation by denouncing supposed new colonial ambitions of traditional Western partners of the region. The Pacific Island countries, and we should keep that well in mind, have their own national interests, and they pursue win-win partnership. Since the case of Nauru was mentioned, I believe that my Nauruan friends in Nauru and overseas would agree on the fact that Nauru as a sovereign nation will determine whether option is best for its national interest. Moving to the Arctic, which apparently is disconnected from the Pacific Islands, is geographically distant, yes, but we should remember that we live in an increasingly integrated world. There will be very soon transarctic routes as part of a blue infinity loop of maritime routes. The two regions will be connected also by undersea cables. And we are in Japan, a country that has its head in the Arctic and its feet, if I can use this, analogy in the Pacific. Uh, while big power rivalry is fully played in the Pacific Islands, is still a possibility, still potential in the Arctic. There's still time, as Dr. Wersweitz has said. So for the sake of having an efficient benign and beneficial Arctic governance also in undersea cable development, diplomatic savviness, scientific cooperation, and pursuit of a win-win solution will be necessary because the first beneficiaries of and the sea cable development and connectivity in the Arctic, as Dr. Schwetz said, should be the Arctic communities, the Arctic countries, and also the sub-Arctic states. Finally, international law. I believe that in many instances, and vis-a-vis -vis the rapid development of the undersea cable connectivity, international law treaties and instruments are showing their limits or inadequacy. So new rules 
frameworks, instruments, and jurisprudence need to be fielded in order to catch up with the, also with the undersea cable development. Finally, allow me to conclude by saying that I look forward to keep exploring the promises and outcomes and the possibilities of undersea cable development in the new frontiers of the Pacific Islands and the Arctic, together with Dr. Schretz, Dr. Watson, and you all. Thank you very much for your attention. Fabricio, thank you very much, Fabricio. His comment and the question raised is now presented. If uh, two speakers uh, can respond to those uh, questions and comments. So first, uh, Dr. Watson, if you can respond to comments made uh, by Fabrizio, please. Thank you very much. So I agree with uh, Fabrizio's point that the local people in the Pacific Island countries are important and they should be the beneficiaries of any potential benefits. Uh, and I'm pleased that he identified that there was a focus on the Pacific people in my presentation. I wholeheartedly agree with his point that the Pacific Island countries' governments should be the ones uh, making their own decisions about their cable choices and so on. So I, uh, I enjoyed Fabrizio's reflections and I uh, thank him, Dr. Bazzato, for his contribution. Thank you. Thank you for your very kind response. Amanda-san, thank you very much. Thank you, Amanda. Now, uh, the Dr. Shibets, would you please respond to the comments made by uh, Dr. Botsat? Thank you, Fabrizio, for highlighting the most important ideas that we previously expressed with Amanda also. And uh, regarding the human security and the human component, um, I would also highlight it in relation to the Arctic. As I have mentioned, in uh, among uh, one of the securities is the human securities. And in particular, what I am concerned and interested in the Arctic is that uh, from the one point, the beneficials that Arctic communities um, may receive with the development of Arctic infrastructure, but on the other hand, lose of their indigenous way of living traditions and customs. And here's again where uh, the governments of the Arctic states shall step in and uh, to uh, develop an, an efficient and uh, adequate regulation so that to prevent that from from happen. And uh, I enjoyed a lot uh, both the presentations of, uh, of my colleague uh, Dr. Watson as well as Fabricio's comments and I look forward for further cooperation and perhaps of finding um, similarities or uh, vice versa, any distinctive features of these two interesting uh, regions of the world, the Pacific and the Arctic, and in particular, development of submarine cables there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your response. Daria, thank you very much. Now I'd like to invite the... the, the uh, viewers for the comments and the questions. So cooperation is necessary while respecting the sovereignty of uh, countries. This is an, uh, one important factor attracting apparently many viewers. First question, the concerning uh, laying and operation of uh, the submarine cables, I understand that uh, China, United States, and European nations are competing, but how about the other countries? Uh, what roles do you think other countries, for example, Japan, uh, could play or should play? So would uh, any uh, one of you, Amanda or Daria, would you please respond to this question? Maybe I might start. Just uh, by mentioning that some of the cables have been laid by the Japanese company NEC, 
in the in the Pacific region and in particular in what is often referred to as Micronesia, the Japanese uh, Japan listed company NEC has uh, laid a few of the cables, including in the Federated States of Micronesia and cables to and from Guam, a cable between Palau and Guam uh, and cables, including one for the Commonwealth of Mariana Islands. Uh, so there's uh, Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, I should have said. So uh, there is a Japanese company that has laid a number of the cables in the Pacific and uh, in particular in that Micronesian subregion. So that uh, there is already Japanese activity in that space. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Daria, would you please uh, the, uh, respond to this question or you don't uh, need to perhaps? Now we have another question. This is a question addressed to Professor Shibetz about undersea cable development in Arctic area. The security related risk was explained, which was very clear. The, if we are to pursue the international uh, the governance in, in place of the uh, governance and control by the domestic law of the uh, Russian uh, Federation, are there any other examples in other regions that we can refer to and try to apply to Arctic region? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? This is, this is interpreter speaking. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? This is translation. Uh, the translator speaking. Can you hear me? Hi. Okay, great. So. On behalf of the uh, translator, I would I, uh, I will I ask the question in English, and the, to the uh, Professor Chubet, uh, the question is: Do we really understand about the kind of uh, security importance of the uh, uh, in uh, polar uh, area? At the uh, uh, to exclude the control by the Russian federations how we can uh, control internationally of the underwater uh, submarine cable. Do you have any idea or do you know any example of the other area how we can control of that uh, cable internationally? Well, that would come perhaps uh, through the international cooperation and in particular in the case of the Arctic through the uh, Arctic Council. We cannot uh, control uh, formally, let's say, it directly. Why? Because of the reasons I have explained in the presentation is that the international law and the law of the sea clearly establishes, establishes the zones and divides the, uh, the whole territory of ocean into particular zones where um, states are entitled to exercise certain uh, rights and obligations. And since this first transarctic submarine cable will be laid um, in the maritime zones under control of the Russian Federation, this is little we can do from this point, from the point of the law of the sea. However, in the framework of international cooperation in the Arctic um, Council, there is still a room, I believe, uh, to influence and to govern this question so that uh, the interest of all stakeholders participating in it, uh, the Russian Federation, foreign states, indigenous communities, uh, private companies, uh, telecommunications companies, and everybody interested in the construction and maintenance of this cable can be, um, can be brought together and that the adequate governance is elaborated. Thank you Thank you. Uh, may I continue with the question list? I have another question. Just recently, Quad agreed on joint uh, the initiative on MDA. 
And when it comes to underwater cable, are there any similar initiatives or activities that are currently under planning, or is it likely that the similar initiatives、uh, may be、uh, considered? Are the, there any development or initiatives including,、uh, involving QUAD? I think this is a question to Dr. Watson. Yes, so one example that I could give is a cable that is being planned that has been announced for Palau, which is an independent Pacific Island nation in the Micronesian sub region.、Uh, Palau currently has one cable going from there to Guam, and then the internet traffic can go on from Guam to elsewhere, including the United States and Asia and so on. Um, so, they currently have one cable, which means there is a risk if that cable was to be damaged or something, then they would lose their internet connections in Palau. So, there's a second cable that's been agreed to, and that's a trilateral partnership, so a funding agreement between Japan, Australia, and the United States. So, those three countries, Japan, the United States of America, and Australia, will work together to fund the second cable. For Palau. And so that I think is an example of co cooperation between countries,、um, you know, to, to address the cable access needs in certain countries. Thank you very much. So, Fabrizio, do you have a comment、uh, having listened to discussions、uh, amongst、uh, the speakers so far? Speakers were very clear in、uh, expounding the situation of undersea cable developments in their respective region of interest.、Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Schwartz to elaborate a little bit more on the potential legal framework that could be. Devised and fielded in the Arctic region because those will be one of the best w a y to ensure that geopolitical rivalry will be contained to, well, let's call them acceptable level. Thank you. Thank you、uh, for this question.、Um, on the international law arena, there were talks and proposals from different researchers on how we can improve the legal regime of submarine cables on the international level. And among the, among the proposals, there were several, starting from drafting a separate convention regulating exclusively submarine cables、um, to drafting、uh, an additional agreement,、uh, an annex. Uh, to already existing agreements, or perhaps not even、uh, touching and regulating、um, the issue on the international law funding level, but to regulate the issue through the soft,、uh, soft law mechanisms. If we transmit this practice to the Arctic, I would say that perhaps at least the, the work of the Arctic Council on、um, several key principles of the Uh, submarine cables regulations would be perhaps the best approach where、um, submarine cables will be addressed from the point of view of the, of the Arctic states, from the point of view of, the,、uh, of those states who would,、uh, would like to join the connectivity infrastructure of the Arctic, to address those concerns that I have expressed in my presentation the environmental, military, cybersecurity. Uh, perhaps it should not be a separate、uh, convention and agreement regulating everything in detail because、uh, there are already quite many rules that are contained on the national level. But perhaps several governing principles and the consolidated document to, to address these needs、uh, in the Arctic at the very right moment, right now, before actually the first trans Arctic cable is laid and more projects to come. That would be, I believe, the, the adequate mode, the adequate、uh, regime, how we can address and how we can、uh, improve the question of governance of submarine cables in the Arctic、uh, region specifically. 
Thank you very much. And now I have a little question for uh, Dr. Watson. Uh, Dr. Watson, we are both uh, Pacific Studies scholars, so uh, I would like to ask you whether you see a role for regional or sub-regional intergovernmental organizations in the Pacific Islands region uh, for the sake of furthering an equitable undersea cable development in that part of the world. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Uh, certainly in relation to cyber security, I think there is an opportunity for the Pacific Island governments and authorities to work together, share resources and so on. Uh, so for instance, I recently was involved in a Pacific Internet Governance Forum seminar and there was a great deal of excitement about working together and working collaboratively between regulators in different countries and uh, also understanding that there's very specific technical expertise that perhaps countries can't afford. These small countries can perhaps not afford to have uh, people with specific IT skills full time, but maybe there could be someone employed in, for instance, a regional body and countries could buy that expertise for a day or two or a week or whatever's required. Um, so yeah, I think particularly regarding cybersecurity, there seems to be opportunity and potentially the Pacific Island countries may wish to share expertise regarding regulation and things like that. I, I did pick up in this recent Pacific Internet Governance Forum seminar, a genuine desire from of various countries that were participating to really engage in a dialogue amongst themselves and working out how they could share resources, share expertise and work together. So I think that amongst the Pacific Island countries, there is a desire to, to work together, particularly on cyber security. Thank you very much for your well articulated answer. And now I'll leave the floor to question from our distinguished audience. Thank you. Yes, a question list continues. About the value of the undersea cable, of course, the value of the hardware, the cable itself, and also the value of the information that is flowing inside the cable, that's another value that we have to consider when they are utilized and managed and controlled. Can we consider managing them together or the hardware, the cable as hardware and the security of the information that is flowing inside the cable? We should uh, separate them and manage them, including the security measures to be implemented. Well, that could uh, have implication on engineering solution as well as legal solution that could be applied. There could be two ways to look at this question. So to Amanda, the, the engineering point of view is something that we'd like to expect. And also from Daria, I would like to hear about the legal point of view, how we should separate the, the cable itself, that is hardware, from the information that flows inside the cable. So starting from Amanda, please. Thanks. Yes, one aspect that I had not thought about is this idea of the value being distinct uh, between the hardware and as distinct from the value of the information itself traveling on the cables. But one thing I would say that can be separated out, I think that is worth explaining, is that until I started researching this, I didn't really understand that the, um, the funder of the cable is not necessarily going to be the organization that will own the cable in the long term. And indeed, the country from which the ship might come that might lay the cable might be different again. So in my recent brief paper on Pacific internet cables, I actually had to create different columns, one being for who is the cable owner, as in the company or organization, for instance, maybe a state-owned enterprise in a Pacific Island country that owns the cable, 
as distinct from who it was who funded the cable, which might have been an aid donor or a group of companies or something like that, as distinct from who laid the cable. So there's actually, I think, in terms of the inputs or values or who ends up owning the cables, there's there's different, I think, uh, parts of the process that can be distinguished, which I thought of when I was asked this most interesting question. Uh, just wanted to point out that there is there is a difference. So, for instance, the Coral Sea Cable System was funded by Australia, but um, it's owned by the countries themselves. They have wholesale internet providers in the two countries, Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands, that are trying to administer the cables. And it was actually laid by uh, Alcatel Submarine Networks, which is part of Nokia, a Finnish company, a Finland listed company. So the company that laid the cable is not the company that owns it and nor is uh, nor is it the, com the country in this case that funded it. So that's not really answering the question, sorry, but that is a, something that I thought of in relation to this question. Thank you. Thank you. What about in Europe? The general data protection regulation is there in Europe. That is about the data per se that is in distribution is subject to protection. And that's a scheme uh, in Europe. So from scheme point of view or from legal point of view, if Daria can comment on this question. Daria, what is your view on this question? Regarding the gener general data protection regulation, uh, it shall be understood that this is the uh, regulation that was enacted in the framework of the European Union, and mostly it applies to the countries of the European Union. The European Union. However, it protects all the consumers uh, residing in the European Union, even though their data is uh, treated and is uh, processed abroad. So in the in that sense, um, and from the Arctic uh, regulation and the Arctic uh, point of view, the Arctic uh, states, some, some of them uh, have enacted also the personal data protection regulation, and the Russian Federation as well has its own legislation on data protection regulation. So that is uh, actually an open question, how uh, the data questions and the data processing will be addressed. So far, I haven't uh, encountered any, any issues of the data and uh, in relation to Arctic uh, submarine cables. And uh, we will probably see it when the first cable will be constructed in 2026. Perhaps uh, the issues regarding data will arise. Uh, so far, I would not say that that's probably a major concern. But uh, thank you for bringing this up, and this is something definitely that we have to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, the, I try to merge. Uh, no, I try to merge two questions into one. Next, at least in Japan, laying and operation of. Uh, uh, submarine cables are mostly uh, done by NEC and other private companies, but uh, the public sector government or the soft law, how do you think uh, that these, uh, what roles do you think uh, these uh, can play, the role of state, the role of uh, the public sector, and the role of uh, the soft law? example, in addition to private sector. So, Daria, perhaps, uh, could you please uh, respond to this question? Yes, uh, I, I may try. Uh, regarding the soft law and soft law regulations, I, I have mentioned, um, I have briefly mentioned in, in, the my, in my presentation, and indeed, some scholars and uh, the academics uh, think that that might be a really efficient way without posing uh, binding obligations on state, but uh, regulating the, the relations by 
using soft law instruments. And in particular, the Arctic is full of soft law instruments. And as I have mentioned, there are only several binding agreements regulating different aspects of the Arctic. So um, in the Arctic region, it is uh, perhaps we will follow the same tendency in relation to submarine cables as well. So soft law and uh, non-binding principles, but those respected by uh, Arctic and non-Arctic states. Uh, this is the this is the way, the very, um, let's say, uh, the very probable way of how the Arctic govern the, the governance of submarine cables on uh, in the Arctic region will be developed in the future. Uh, thank you very much. And now, uh, the uh, further two or one or two questions. Uh, it's a rather simple one. Uh, NEC and the Facebook plan and uh, operates, for example, uh, the uh, Trans Pacific uh, the, uh, large cables. Uh, these are often covered by the media, and uh, the trans uh, the, the capacity will be the uh, uh, the uh, largest in the world. Uh, do you think that that the uh, capacity has been uh, rather overestimated, or by expanding the capacity and by increasing the bandwidth? Uh, what the uh, implications uh, do you think they have? For example, I think uh, the Pacific Islands will introduce uh, the uh, broader uh, the bandwidth uh, uh, cables uh, in the future. Uh, so before and after uh, the broadband uh, the a cable, uh, what uh, the uh, changes or the uh, implications uh, do you expect? Uh, yes, excuse me, Amanda, yes, please. I can certainly say that the some of the internet cables going to the Pacific Island countries do not have uh, all of the capacity being used. Some of the cables have much more capacity than is currently being used. So um, there is potential for further uptake of internet. Uh, certainly it's clear that there are many people in the Pacific who are not using the internet at all. So there is opportunity for an increase in the number of internet users. And those who are using it are perhaps not using it very much because they can't afford it or because they're busy doing other things such as their subsistence farming and so on. So uh, I think um, there is scope for an increase in the use of the internet. And certainly some of the countries have internet capacity through their cables that they currently have that they're not currently using. Uh, so that's one thought I wanted to mention in response to the question. Thank you very much. So uh, we are closer to the time we are supposed to and so, but the management and the the way uh, uh, the future of the submarine cable. We'd like to uh, discuss the outlook of the uh, submarine cable and what approaches uh, do you think we should adopt in order to uh, the address uh, issues surrounding the uh, submarine uh, cable. I'd like to invite uh, the uh, speakers and the discussant uh, for uh, comments. Uh, not one sentence comment, but uh, uh, you could uh, speak uh, as much as uh, as uh, much as you like. So, uh, Daria, perhaps would you please uh, go first? Yes, uh, I think so. Uh, the question was, uh, what, what is the process? What how we can act? What we can do in order to uh, ensure that the development of submarine cables is. Uh, being done smoothly and that we can uh, ensure that we can use this connectivity infrastructure in the Arctic. Well, um, from my point of view, I would say that the first thing that we shall do is probably increase the visibility on submarine cables problems, uh, not only in the Arctic and in the Pacific, but uh, overall worldwide. I'm aware that uh, I have started um, doing this submarine cable topic, uh, I think, 
something for, I'm doing it for eight uh, years or something like this. I'm doing my research on cables. And uh, every year I see that more and more events, uh, more organizations, more research groups are involved in this. And this is a really good sign so that uh, to increase the visibility and uh, attract the attention from the society to the problems, concerns and issues that we may face um, in the area of submarine cables uh, in certain regions as well as worldwide. So that's, uh, I would say, this is a good tendency that we need to, uh, that we shall keep doing and uh, spreading our knowledge and, knowledge and sharing our knowledge with, with other actors. Then, uh, Talking from the legislative perspective, perhaps uh, from the legal, I have addressed uh, already the question regarding the government, submarine cables governance. In the Arctic, that perhaps that would come uh, in the framework of the Arctic Council and in the, in the form of the soft law instruments. Um, I'm not sure how we shall uh, address this uh, topic in the area of the Asia Pacific because I, I believe I do not have sufficient knowledge on this region, although after Amanda's uh, presentation, I really wish to explore more about this region and cables. But uh, in the worldwide scenario, uh, it is very unlikely that the international community will uh, will adopt any inter separate international convention or uh, any other agreement in relation to submarine cables because the law of the sea already exists. It governs submarine cables and it was a, uh, a big deal for all the states uh, to sit together and to finally negotiate this text. So it uh, is very unlikely that um, the legal regime of submarine cables will be amended formally through the formal procedures. But uh, here comes the idea that perhaps on the worldwide level also the instruments that uh, may react to, it, to changes and that may help improve the governance in the Arctic region would be also through the soft law instruments. But this uh, certainly requires more research uh, to propose uh, certain, uh, certain clauses, certain um, amendments and this is something uh, to be done i think in the in the near future thank you hi daria shivet sensei hontoni arimasu thank you professor daria shivet now i'd like to turn to dr amanda watson if you can give us your concluding remarks yes thank you yes my passion is to see that the people in the pacific island countries my one talks in Papua New Guinea and uh, dear friends and, and others in a range of countries around the Pacific are able to access reliable and affordable telecommunications, including the internet. I think it would be wonderful if a whole range of partners and friends of the Pacific, including Japan, could collaborate together to come up with a comprehensive strategy to ensure that none of the citizens are left behind, that all of the citizens of the Pacific have access to electricity, telecommunications and the internet. Um, if that collaboration could be done in a peaceful manner, I think that would be ideal. And of course, crucially, it must involve consultation with the leaders in the Pacific Island countries to ascertain what it is that they would like for their countries. Uh, I think that's what I would like to, to see in the future. Thank you very much for the question. Amanda H. Watson says. Thank you, Dr. Watson. We really appreciate your comments. And now, last but not the least, I'd like to turn to Dr. Bozzato, please. Well, I wish to join Dr. Akamatsu in thanking uh, Dr. Schwetz and Dr. Watson for their brilliant, informative, insightful presentation. And in conclusion, allow me to reiterate the motto of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation and extend it to all of us. Let us keep thinking, doing, and innovating. Thank you very much. Thank you.
we'll be ready very soon. では、ワトソン研究員、えー、シュベツ兼任教授、ボツァット国研究。ドクター・ワトソン、ドクター・シュベツ、ドクター・ボツァット、Thank you very much indeed. Now I turn the microphone to the secretariat. ワトソン研ドクター・ワトソン、ドクター・シュベッツ、ドクター・ボツアウト、ドクター・カマツ、Thank you very much。Now、uh,、ドクター・アツシ、スナミ、プレスデント・フササカ・ピース・ファンデーション、アーディ・コンクルーツ、ウィッド・サム・アーディ・リマークス。I'm Sunami, the president of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. Before concluding this seminar, I'd like to say a few words. Today, the theme was about the subsea cable development and security prospects from the Pacific Islands to the Arctic Sea to discuss the situation in the Arctic Sea and Pacific Island, which stands at the forefront of the development of the subsea cable network, which is now exponentially expanding. Trying to elucidate more light on the international relationship as well as、uh, the, the various systems and regime schemes、uh, that are there to support the development. We heard expert presentations,、uh, uh, insightful presentations from Dr. Watson, Professor Chavetz, on their、uh, uh, views on subsea cable、uh, from their expert. Point of view. And also, Dr. Bozard, who was a proponent of the, today's seminar, proposed for this seminar from his point of view on ocean political science or politics. And、uh, here we try to move forward with the a blue ocean that could be the new research area for subsea cable, which used to be considered from technology or engineering point of view. And in this respect, I'd like to thank all of you for your interest by raising your questions and comments、uh, who participated this seminar、uh, remotely.、Uh, this session、uh, was hosted by OPRI, but、uh, in the future, we plan to promote active cooperation with other departments and functions within the foundation, including security research group as well as the Japan US research group, to propose the、uh, various. Uh, the views on development of subsea cable network,、uh, which are multifaceted from private、uh, sector think tank point of view, helped that the, this seminar helped you to raise your interest and awareness about the subsea cable network and hope that you would continue to extend your support and cooperation together with understanding. Before conclusion, I'd like to thank all of you for your contribution. Uh, thanks to you, the seminar came to a reality. With this, I'd like to conclude my closing remarks. Once again, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much, Dr. Tsunami, President of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. This concludes OPRI virtual seminar on subsea cable development and security prospects from the Pacific Islands to the Arctic Sea. We ask for your feedback. Feedback could be sent by 23 59, that is 11 59 p.m. Please send your feedback uh, by uh, accessing the link that appears in the bottom of the screen. We'd like to also announce、uh, the Ocean Forum、uh, that is organized on October 21st, as well as 8th Maritime Security Symposium on October 25th, together with other events. Please refer to the website or mail magazine of the OPRI for details about those future events. And in addition to the seminar that you have just、uh, participated, we have A variety of content、uh, that are offered through YouTube channel. Hope that you would register the channel and also give us your high credit、uh, for the、uh, seminars. And also, please access and follow Twitter as well as Facebook 
of uh, OPRI to uh, access latest information. Once again, thank you very much for your participation.